The minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days. And the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built, wars were fought, victims' names were read, survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. But one thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God. God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He is closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. We will always remember. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I would probably venture to guess that many of you spent yesterday reflecting of what 20 years ago happened, what happened 20 years ago. And I don't know what you did to reflect that. I don't know what you did to remember that. Uh, but there were things that I watched yesterday that just brought back memories of what happened on that fateful day. One of the things that's unique about 9-11 is the fact that no matter how long I live, I will always remember how many years it's been. Because you see, Brenna was born in 2001. And so however old she is, I want to know how long ago that's been. And I can't help but tell you that when all this was unfolding, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is going on? Bringing this baby into the world of hate and terror. What is going on? The common theme yesterday I kept hearing over and over, is, you know where you were, you know what you were doing, you probably remember what you were thinking when you heard this happen, and I just happened to be getting my hair cut, which I know that seems funny as of now because I don't have any hair, but I was sitting in the chair, and the lady that was cutting my hair was from England, and her daughter or sister called from England and said, hey, you need to turn on the TV, something is going on in your country. That's how quick everything changed and how quick news spreads. One of the things I did yesterday was to get a different perspective of what the world thought of 9-11. And Luke happened to have on an interview with uh, some people who were from Australia, a gentleman who was uh, happened to be in the World Trade Center uh, that day when this was happening. And as I was listening to him describe the events of what he experienced that day, things just started to pop into my head. One of the things he said that just overwhelmed him or what was just amazing was as he was coming out, he saw firefighters running in. And he thought to himself, man, that is the heart of a servant. That is the heart of someone who is sacrificing. These men and women were running in to snatch people from a fire. It just so happened on Saturday in my Bible reading, I'm going through the Bible, and I come to the book of Jude. Jude's a book that many of you probably haven't read much. It's kind of tucked away just before Revelation. And as I was reading through my devotion, I came across this verse, and I couldn't help but think, being reminded again, even 20 years ago, God is still telling us to do exactly what those men and women did by running into the fire 
to snatch people out. You see, folks, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's saying. And we have his word right here. Listen to what Jude says in Jude 22 and 23. He says this, Be merciful to those who doubt. We live in a world of doubt right now, don't we? Listen, or be merciful to those who doubt, saving others by snatching them from the fire. Did you know that was even in there? Snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained with corrupt flesh. September 11th, 2001 is exactly what everybody said yesterday, a day that changed America. Folks, we are in the business of doing what the firefighters did, and that is to run in opposition of the world. We are to run into the fire. We have people who are dying and going to hell, and we need to run into the fire, snatching them, snatching them, bringing them back to us. Folks, God knows what he's doing. Are we willing to listen? And that's going to tie into what we're talking about today. If you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the 80s. But before we jump into that, what I want to do right now is I just want us to take time to remember and reflect of what it was like that day. And I want us to pray for our country. So as I'm praying, I want you to say a prayer yourself. Because we have things to do there's no more playing around there's no more messing around it's time to snatch people from the fire let's pray god i thank you for this day and i thank you for the opportunity that we can kind of reflect back on what happened 20 years ago a day that did change america but lord we have opportunities every day to change other people's lives right now God, give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the boldness to run in opposition of this world, to rescue people from the fires of hell. God, thank you for your son, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, last week we started a series on the 80s, and uh, we were talking about the decades of the 80s, and we started doing some just reminiscing of what it was like back in that, that day. So we're going to continue on today, and we have some pictures for you to maybe bring back some of those wonderful memories of the 80s. One of the big things in the 80s, if you remember, was the time of fashion, what, what people were wearing. If you remember, there was this big craze of doing acid wash jeans. Do you remember, remember doing that? Acid wash jeans. I think we have some pictures. Go ahead and throw them up, Luke. Here you go. Now, that's a denim jacket, of course, that was acid wash. But we, it was just one of those things where you would do it and take off the denim part and make you just look cool and hip and everything. And everyone was doing it. And it was just a thing of, of the 80s. Now, if you're a lady, the big thing was for you to have shoulder pads. You remember that? You remember the shoulder pads? Um, kind of looked like a, a linebacker. And, um, and all that. Come on, keep up, buddy. There you go. All right, so we had the shoulder pads and, and, and just ex neat stuff. I mean, just kind of made you look, blah. but men, you weren't exempt. If you remember this thing called Purple Rain, uh, you know, I think it was something we remember, you know, Prince and Purple Rain. He was all decked out. You remember that? And he, now I never dressed like Prince. I wouldn't look good, but that's the way it is. All right, but here's one that I know that you will remember because it was my staple. It was what I went to to get the girls, and that was this. Are you ready? My silk shirt. Silk shirts were, were awesome back then, and, I, man, I rocked it. That's how they, man, I was just a man. Anyway, so silk shirts, that was awesome back then. Uh, of course, anything in the 80s you remember mostly is just neon. Neon was everywhere. I mean, everywhere you look, there was neon. I mean, I got neon on my shoes. Anyway, neon. Neon was it. And okay, you can't go throughout the 80s and not talk about the following, which is this. You ready, Luke? Go for it. Hairstyles. <laughs> you remember the hairstyles back in the 80s? Man, they were awesome. I mean, what I would do was when I was in high school, what I would do is when I would go into a room for the first time, and if they didn't have assigned seating, what I would do, I would find the girl with the highest hair and sit behind her. 
So that way I knew the teacher couldn't see me. But hair was an awesome thing back then. And that's all we're going to talk about that now because I'm just kind of jealous of anybody who has a lot of hair. Anyway, another thing is shoes. Shoes was a big thing. You remember Eastlands and uh, L.A. Gear and then what you see on the screen, K-Swiss. Now I know K-Swiss is still around, but man, I loved them back in the day. And it just drove me up the wall that when I got a scuff on it for the first time, I was like, oh no, my white shoes are messed up. But we had awesome shoes back then and we really liked to style it out. But we have really enjoyed the 80s. And if you didn't live in the 80s, Man, we were just hoping that this series is just raising your awareness of what a wonderful decade it really was. And so if you have any questions, come see me and we will talk about the 80s and let you know how great it was. But the thing that I want us to go to today and understand today is that God is awesome as well. Even though it was a great decade, a great thing, and we're having fun with that, I want us to understand that we need to worship in the presence of the Lord. That we need to worship in the presence of the Lord. Last week we talked about God restoring you. God making you new again. God giving you a second chance in this dark world that we live in. In Psalm 80, we've already read it today, he says this, Restore us, O God. Make me new again. Give me another chance. Make your face shine upon me so that we, so that I, can be saved. You see, God wants to give you a second chance. He wants to make you new again. And so he sent his son to give us that chance, to offer us that opportunity. As I said last week, this is kind of like a back to the basics series where we're exploring some of God's key foundational truths about who God is, what God does, how he works in our lives. And so today we're going to look at Psalm 81, if you want to turn over there. You see, one of the things you've got to understand about the book of Psalms is this, is that some of the Psalms that we read are people speaking to God. People are speaking to God. They're crying out to the Lord. And then there are some Psalms, like today, where God is speaking to his people. God is speaking to us. And that is exactly what Psalm 81 is today. It is God speaking to his people. In the Old Testament, the people of God were the Israelites. Now I want you to think about this for just a moment. And today, the people of God is the church. The people of God are his children. The people of God are are people who, who follow him. And that is who he's speaking to today. Last week, as I said, we explored the attitude that God restores us, gives us a second chance. Today, we're going to unpack the truth that God provides. He provides. And and when God speaks to us, we need to listen to him. In Psalm 81, God says this in verse 10. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide. And I will fill it. Now, there are some times and some Sundays where I will come up to you and I will confess to you some of the things that I do in my life. And this week was no different. Today, as I, or this week, as I read that verse, I have to tell you, I wasn't very pastor like this week. Because as I read that verse, I get to the very end. It says, Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Just does not sound very scriptural to me. I kind of got a chuckle out of it. But what it did remind me of was when I was in youth ministry, there was a game we used to play every time we were at camp called Chubby Bunny. Have you ever heard of Chubby Bunny? Chubby Bunny is a fun game where you get a bag of marshmallows, and what you have to do is every time uh, you put a marshmallow in your mouth, you have to say the word Chubby Bunny. So you put the first marshmallow in, no problem. Chubby Bunny, I mean, it comes out clear. Then you put a second one in, a third one in. You get a dozen marshmallows in your mouth and you're going brr, 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 you can't say it it's just hard to do and then what happens when you get more than 12 you spew everything out which is the fun part of the whole thing now I don't think that God was creating a youth group game for us to do in the 80s and 90s I don't think that is what the purpose of this verse is 
Here's the plain truth and the powerful truth that I want you to understand today with that verse. Open your mouth and I will fill it. And that is this. God provides. God provides. You see, one of the most basic foundational truths about God is that He is our provider. He is the one that provides for us. Listen to this. We are completely, totally, absolutely reliant on His provision in our lives. Do you understand that? We are completely, totally, absolutely reliant on His provision. So here's my question that I want you to ponder today. If that is true, if God is really my provider, if God is really your provider, why do so many of us feel so unfulfilled? Why do we feel that way? If God said, open your mouth and I will fill it, why do so many of us in life feel so empty? And I know you do, and I know you do. Why do we feel that way? Well, God tells us this in in Psalm 81. Let's go a little bit farther. Uh, Verses 10 through 12, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people, who was his people? Israel. Who are we? God's children. Where? Listen, because this applies to us. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to their stubborn heart to follow their own plans. God wants to provide for us. He wants to fill us. But a lot of us are going through life on empty. And God gives us a couple reasons of why we're on empty in this verse. First of all, we are empty because we are disobedient. And disobedience leads to emptiness. Understand that. Repeat that with me. Disobedience leads to emptiness. It leads to emptiness. God wants to provide for us. He wants to fill us, but his provision is linked to our obedience. He he just tells us that right now in that verse. Look again what God said. I want to fill you. I want to provide for my people, but my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. Here's another question I want you to ponder this morning. Anybody here got a problem with stubbornness? (laughs) Amen. Amen. Let's go even a little bit deeper. Is anybody married to someone with the problem of stubbornness? <laughs> that can be another sermon. We won't talk that one right now. God said, I want to fill my people, but I can't do that when they are stubborn and they refuse to listen to me. When they won't submit to me, When they disobey me, I can't fill them. Disobedience leads to emptiness. You're going to catch that here in a little bit. So many times in our lives, so many times, we completely ignore what God says. We're asking for God's guidance. We want him to to lead us, but then we just completely ignore what he says, and then we're shocked that our lives are so empty. Let me give you some examples. In Colossians chapter 3, the apostle Paul said this, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are to forgive. That's a command. That's what God is telling us to do. Forgive. In fact, we are commanded to forgive other people. Are you ready? Just as the Lord God forgave us. Forgiveness is complete in total control by God. We need to obey this command. You see, forgiveness is undeserved. And that's the kind of forgiveness that God extended to us and what we need to extend to other people. They don't, have, they don't deserve it. 
they don't even have to ask for it. We simply forgive. And I know, I know that is hard. I know it's hard. It doesn't feel good. Forgiving is not fun. And so a lot of us say, you know, I don't think I can do that, which is telling God I'm not going to obey you, your command. Because, see, you got to understand something. It is so much easier to hold on to a grudge, isn't it? It's so much easier to hold on to a grudge. It feels more right to hold on to my anger. It just feels better to hold on to my bitterness. But God gives us a clear command. He gives us a clear command. We make the decision to disobey that command. And you know what we get out of that deal? Emptiness. Emptiness. Be honest. Does bitterness really feel better? I, I've been bis- bitter before, and it just gnaws at you and gnaws at you and gnaws at you, doesn't it? Does bitterness really make you feel better? Is your anger really helping you? And we know it's not. You can be stubborn and argue with this, or you can own up to the truth. It's not helping you. It's harming you. It's holding you down. It's not filling you. It's draining you. That is what disobedience does. Disobedience leads to emptiness. Let me share with you another example of how we can be fulfilled, how God provides. Psalm 119 says this, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In Colossians 3, Paul wrote, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. These are clear commands. This is what God is telling us to do. Spend time in the Word. Spend time with God. Read, contemplate, memorize Scripture. How many of us are doing this on a regular basis? How many of us are doing this on a regular basis? The command is clear, but it's so easy to think the following. Well, I, I'm just too busy today. I, I don't have time for that. I'll get to it tomorrow. And probably more times than not, when you get up the next day, you'll say, I'm too busy today. I'll get, get with God tomorrow. And a week goes by, a month goes by, and even a year can go by without you spending any time in the Word of God. And He commanded us to do it. And that, my friends, is a guarantee for emptiness. Paul said, let the, Christ, let the Word of Christ dwell richly among you, abundantly, overflowing. That can't happen if you don't spend daily time in the Bible. That can't happen if your only exposure to the Bible is what you get on this room on Sunday mornings. If you depend on this hour to sustain you through this week, you're going to be empty. Now, what happens in this room on Sundays is awesome. I love coming. I look forward to coming to church on Sunday so that I can worship with my brothers and sisters. I really like it. It is really good. I love the worship experience that we have here at First Christian Church. But no matter how good it is, no matter how good the worship is, no matter how powerful the preaching is, it is not enough to sustain you throughout the week. I mean, we're good, but we're not that good, okay? You have your part to do as well. If this is the only time you worship, if this is the only time that you're in the Bible you're going to have this week, then you are going to be empty. That's all there is to it. You have to fill yourself up. You have to listen to God. God wants to fill you, but you are disobeying him when you don't do that. Disobedience leads to what? Emptiness. One more. This is a tough one. This is one where people are like, Oh no, here you go, stepping on my toes again. Well, I'm just giving you a warning. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He wrote this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap, also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. God has always commanded his people to be generous. He has commanded his people to to be generous, giving, generosity, tithing. It's been the hallmark of God's people. And it comes with a promise. It comes with a promise that if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you'll reap generously. It kind of sounds counterintuitive, but God said that you will be filled when you give. 
But it's not easy, is it? It's not easy. Not with rising gas prices, not with high food prices, not with medical bills, not with uh, utility bills, not with car repair bills. It's just easier to think the following. Well, when things get a little bit better, then I'll be generous. Then I'll give. I, I told you earlier this is confession time. It's snuck into my mind before, too. When things get easier or when things get better, I'll give. But we all know the truth, don't we? That day will never come. That day will never come. There will always be another reason why you can't be generous. It's kind of like when you were told when you were younger um, that you're not going to get married till you have enough money. Well, if that's the case, I would still be single 22 years later. It's, always, it's not always going to be there. Start now. Make a plan. I know times are, are, are tough right now. And, and, and the church teaches that to give 10%, and you're probably thinking to yourself, I can't give 10% right now. That's okay. God wants you to give from the joy, joy, joyfulness of your heart. Give what you can. Give back to God. And you will start to become fulfilled. I, I don't think personally God looks at the amount that you give. I think he looks at the heart of how you give it. So if you've got to start small, start small. But part of that worship and what we give back to God is what he has blessed us with. So don't be ashamed in what you give, but give back as a joyful servant, giving back to the Lord. You see, these are just a handful of examples of disobedience leading to emptiness. God wants to fill us physically, emotionally, spiritually. But for a lot of us, the tank is empty because we've been stubborn. We've refused to submit to God in some area of our life. We've been disobedient, and disobedience leads to emptiness. Now let's go back and look at what God said again. He gives us another reason why we live in this sense of emptiness. Again, Psalm 81, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth, I'll fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel will not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. I can't help but think that when you read that verse, how it parallels so much with us today. We live in a world, we live in a country that is not submitting to the Lord anymore. We are living in a country where we are living and trying to tell God what we want to do. And we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. You see, God tells us they had stubborn hearts, so I gave them over to their own desires. Disobedience leads to emptiness. One reason we live in a sense of emptiness is simply because we are disobedient to God. But God, but another reason is this, choose supervision instead of submission. We choose supervision instead of submitting to God. And you're like, what are you talking about? Instead of submitting to God, we want to supervise Him. We want to tell Him what we want done. Instead of listening to Him, we want to advise Him. Instead of following Him, we want to critique Him. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. Pay attention to the end. God said, but my people who he's blessed, would not listen. They would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts and follow their own devices. God let his people follow their own devices. Other translations say their own counsel or their own ideas. Man, that sounds like where we're living today, doesn't it? We're following our own ideas, our own ways, instead of following God. The picture here is of people who decided that they know better than God. They know better than God. They have their own ideas. They have their own agendas. They have their own standards. And God needs to live up to those standards instead of us living up to God's standards. Instead of submitting, they are supervising. Instead of listening, they are advising God. God said that he would fill his people, but a lot of us have our own ideas of what that means, not what God means. The reason we are living in a sense of emptiness is because God has filled us in ways that we believe he should fill us. 
We follow our own ideas. We have redefined that what provision looks like. And instead of listening to God, we want to tell him to do his job better. We have our own ideas. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God provides. Somebody here today needs to hear this word. Somebody here today needs to understand that God provides. God provides. He provides for all of our our needs. He provides for all that we have. You see, God provided everything to us and for us on the cross. That was his provision so many years ago. I know one of our sayings around here, our, our mantra that we say at the end of every service and that you see on the bulletin and you see different things is that Jesus changes everything. And that is going to be till the day I die, my mantra. Jesus changes everything. But there's also another phrase I want you to keep in your mind is this. Is that everything that we do is all because of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That is his greatest provision that he has given us. You see, you've got to understand, God has never walked away from me. But I may have walked away from God. He never gave up on me when I questioned him. He never let me go when I doubted him. And because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, God provides a new life for me. I can walk in freedom knowing that God conquered death, that there's nothing in my life that he can't handle. There is no greater weapon to overcome emptiness than this. And I want you to write this down. My life is not empty because the tomb is empty. My life is not empty because the tomb is not empty. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. He always provides more love and grace and mercy and forgiveness than I will ever understand because God is my provider. So worship him this week. Not just this morning. This should be the kickoff for your week. Worship him this week because he has provided for you. We're going to have a time of invitation where you can accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to have the Father come into your life and Jesus come into your life and provide you to fill that emptiness that you are so longing, needing to fill. A relationship with his son. And we would love to talk to you about that. And I'll be standing over here to my right if you need to talk to me about uh, Jesus, about having a relationship with him, about partnering with us as we go into this community to show the world that we want to rescue them from the fire and bring them into a relationship with Jesus. We would love to talk to you. Or if you need prayer, and I know some of you need prayer, I know some of you are struggling, we encourage you to go to our left here, and some of our elders will be here to pray with you, to lift you up, to encourage you, and to let you know that we serve a God that provides for all of our needs. And he will always and continue to watch over us. Whatever your decision is, we encourage you to make it today as we stand and sing our song of invitation.